Hi, this is your host Sapin Bharatiya and we are here at Open Source Summit in Bilbao, Spain. And today we have with us once again, Mike Dolan, Senior Vice President and GM of Projects at the Linux Foundation. Mike, it's great to have you on the show again. Nice to be here as well. And today there are so many things to talk about, uh, actually, but Let's just talk about two major announcements or two major things. One was the announcement about the Open Tofu, a nice name there. And second is also the whole Cyber Resiliency Act. Uh, I had a discussion with Gab yesterday because this is kind of a concern for the community as well. So I would like you to pick which topic you want to start with. Uh, let's start with the CRA, I guess. So first of We're all, let's, let's explain <laughs> to, I, I mean, you have a legal background. So just talk about, uh, let's talk about what it is and why the open source community is a bit concerned about it. I mean, so the CRA doesn't require a legal background to understand what it's doing. Um, you know, it's, it's out there, everybody can read it. Um, I think any developer who reads this would say, but that doesn't work. That's not how this works. And yet it's intentionally trying to regulate open source for better security. I, they had good intentions. The intention was, well, if we fix all the security issues up at the open source project level, then everybody downstream will have a perfectly secure code base that comes through the system. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. I mean, anybody who's worked on open source knows that people take modules or bits or pieces. There's different configuration challenges that can raise security issues. And there's a lot that goes into a product decision-making process where you decide how to use a specific upstream open source project. And the challenge is that developers in the upstream open, open source projects are not going to know exactly how downstream users might be using their code base at the end of the day. I mean, Linus is a great engineer. He knows a lot about security. He runs one of the most secure open source projects on the planet. But if somebody goes and takes the Linux kernel and puts it into a nuclear submarine, he's not somebody who's doing functional safety testing or anything like that for that type of use case. But the CRA puts requirements on the developers at the upstream level who maybe also don't have you know, the access to resources that they need to do certain things for, say, nuclear submarine testing. So you know, the challenge is you have a, a new regulation coming along. It was well-intentioned in terms of improving software security in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, the construct at which they went about it was to place liability on the upstream developers. And there we have an issue because developers are coming to an open source project giving a value exchange of here is some code that I have or my company is willing to contribute. And so either a company or developer is contributing code for free for anybody else in the world to use it. Their only ask is that you use it under the open source license. And pretty much every open source license says this is as is. I'm not making any representation that it's good for what you're going to use it for which in many cases they don't know what somebody else is going to use it for. And so if they're not, if they can make that value exchange and they can say, here, take it, let's work on this together, but I can't be liable for whatever you do with it. And the CRA upends that whole structure upon which open collaboration has just thrived over the last couple of decades. Which is kind of ironic because Europe actually is a kind of hub for a lot of grassroots open source development. I mean, the kernel came from here, you know, the whole MySQL, you know, he's also finished. <laughs> that also came from a lot of other projects uh, came there. A lot of open source developers, they scratch their own itch. They create something just because they needed to solve their own problem. They are not, you know, now Amazon, everybody is using their code base, but that's not how they started. So it's kind of conflict with the whole idea of open source, you know, I agree. So now the challenge is that, are you, I mean, what are the solution? Is it that you folks are going to work with the developers to enable them and provide them with resources or to work with the public sector to better understand how open source works? So what is the solution? Well, we've been trying to work with the public sector. Uh, and it's not just the Linux Foundation, the Eclipse Foundation, uh, a number, a Apache Software Foundation, a, a number of the open source foundations that everybody knows, OSI, others have been providing feedback directly to the European Commission when they were drafting the CRA. Um, and when there was an opportunity for them to take input from the open source community. I think the challenge is that the open source ecosystem were not usually at the table around regulations. 
and we were not consulted uh, at the outset. They came up with their first drafts, and then they wanted to defend them. And, um, you know, that's part of their regulatory process, and I'm sure they get pushed back on every regulation they try to pass. But when we look at the impact of this, it's on all software in Europe because very little software today is not built using some open source componentry. And so it, it is a very high impact type of regulation. Some of the terms of this regulation are just probably impossible for many people to comply with. Um, being able to ship code with no known vulnerabilities or whether it's, you know, having to report to Anissa any software vulnerability first, sometimes before the fix is available. I mean, what open source developer wants to go and tell all their users, hey, there's a massive vulnerability coming and uh, we don't have a fix yet. Sorry. No, that's not how the open source community works. They're actively addressing these security issues in the upstream projects. They want to publish a fix and then make sure everybody has a chance to update. Because what is the point of telling people that there's an issue if there there's no fix yet? Is the, like, the the commission who came up with CRA, are they like confusing vendors with develop, open source developer? Because these are the kind of responsibility. There are vendors who are supplying, as you said, the code for a nuclear submarine. That's their responsibility, not the responsibility of an upstream vendor, uh, code writer. In the feedback we got from them, they are very much focused on companies. They think that companies control open source projects in a way that they can just dictate, here's another security process you have to go through in order to comply with the CRA, which works for, you know, one of the organizations they reached out to apparently was the Mozilla Foundation. Well, Mozilla has a very different model from most open source projects. All of or most of the developers work for Mozilla Corporation. And there is a Mozilla Foundation, but at the heart, they have a core engineering team that can build engineering practices in place. But most open source projects are not run like Mozilla. They don't have the funding of Mozilla. They don't have those resources. And so the challenge is, how does a community where maybe somebody's doing it, maybe they work for a company, maybe they have the company's blessing, maybe they're doing it on their own time. But there's a lot of developers out there who are not doing this with a you know, billion dollar company's seal of approval behind them and all the resources they need to implement security practices. So that is a massive challenge for the CRA, which is what it is putting on the upstream developer community as something where we're already dealing with overstressed maintainers and maintainers who are having, you know, needs where as their projects grow and get adopted, they have more and more stresses. And to throw this type of regulation on their laps and say, you're also responsible for this is just it's offensive to some. As you said, you know, you folks are also working with other foundations you know, who are... Uh, can you just give us a quick, you know, that what you have achieved so far or what you're working on or what you see might be kind of to, to end this, you know, kind of deadlock there? I mean, with the other foundations, we've had a good collaboration. We work with Open Forum Europe and a number of organizations to get some common messaging so that we're not looking like we're fragmented in our communications, either at the commission or parliament or any others. And so we've been doing that. I think at this point now we're out talking to the companies that are major economic uh, factors for the European Union and helping them understand why this is an issue. And I think a big challenge that we ran into is that in the companies, when the CRA was being proposed, it went through their regulatory and policy uh, contacts. They didn't know about the open source implications. They didn't understand this is an open source issue. And there wasn't really like always an open source group that they had to go consult. And so for many of the companies we've been talking to, this is the first time the open source group is dealing with the public policy group. And so there wasn't natural internal connections about this where they could help elevate the concerns. But when we do get to somebody at like a CTO level, it's immediately obvious to them what the issues are. And so they get fired up and now we're trying to figure out how do we channel you know, their energy and their comments back into the process. But at this point, they've been pushing the process as fast as they can. And so it's really hard to take the time to slow things down to say, hey, what this should this look like and how can we adjust it to be appropriate. Thanks for uh, talking about that. Um, hopefully these issues will be resolved in a given time, otherwise it's going to be a big crisis. Now let's talk about another topic, which is open tofu. So talk a bit about the whole like idea behind open tofu, because I have not seen Linux Foundation you know, getting involved, but this is also critical to the larger community, because there are a lot of projects that 
the community relies on. So someone has to take, you know, a step there. So talk about the whole idea behind Open Tofu. Yeah, the idea behind Open Tofu, tofu is simple. You have a platform technology that has been disseminated for years out throughout the ecosystem, has been built into other products and solutions. Many of our open source projects have dependencies on it. Um, and it's not necessarily the thing that everybody wants or needs to pay for. It was just a solution that was available at the time under an appropriate license for adopting into your dependency tree. And so a number of companies, open source projects, developers started relying on uh, Terraform as their option for you know, uh, infrastructure as code. And so it, it became pervasive in many ways. Uh, because of the license. If the license had been a business source license at the beginning, none of these organizations or open source projects would have adopted it like they did. They would have treated it like the commercial product that that license aligns to. And so in that case, we have a lot of developers who are angry about this situation. They're angry. They're, they you know made a decision to take a pen, de- de- dependency on this project and then now their executive chain is having to deal with the ramifications of that. And it puts some pressure on them internally. So there's a number of people who are looking for an outlet. And, you know, the time classic, you know, model that, you know, allows users of open source licensed software to shape their own course is the ability to fork. And uh, we have dealt with some forks before, like Node.js had, you know, some forks and others in our, in our ecosystem that we've worked with have had forks over time. But um, this is a unique situation we're dealing with. We have venture capital backed companies who own the code base who are able to relicense in such a way that they can sow a field with all of these instances and then come back years later, change the terms on that license and make this now a different value exchange than what everybody else was expecting. And some companies may be fine with that. Some developers may be okay with that, but there's a lot who aren't. And so it was no surprise to us that, you know, right away they announced OpenTF.org, which eventually became OpenTofu. And so OpenTofu is now a place where people who do want to have a say in where this technology goes in the future and do so under a reasonable open source license can come together and work on it together. We have been seeing this disturbing trend, but with the, with the creation of open tofu, you know, it's also sending a message that uh, that message is not, I see for the corporate, the creators, but for the user community that you don't have, because we tend to forget that we are serving the consumers, consumers who are using these uh, open source code base to build solution companies. Uh, those are the, I mean, that's what who we are serving. So talk a bit about, first of all, how worried you are about this trend of companies changing the license. At the same time, uh, with this creation, are you also sending out a message that no, the community will be taken care of? To take your question in reverse order, I think the community has spoken. You have end users like Alliance, who was on stage today talking about, you know, open tofu and their plans. And the end users are coming forward and saying, this is not what we expected. This is not the value exchange we signed up for when we took a dependency on this. And we're going to go into a different direction. And I I think that is a natural response in terms of, you know, where this, you know, all starts or a trend. I I think we've seen a trend of this out of the venture capital community mostly. Um, And that's where a lot of these business source licenses and and, uh, others started was how do we you know get to the next level of revenue growth and it's one thing to be a couple hundred million dollar a year company maybe they want to be a billion dollar company and by changing the terms we can suddenly juice the revenues for a little bit i don't know if that will long term work out for them um i wish all the companies who do this the best i'm not i don't i'm not antagonistic towards them but they shouldn't be surprised when they change the value equation with their end users and developer communities that they may not go along with that and that may not be what they signed up for and so what we'll see is we'll see you know options out there on the market and i've never seen it be bad for options to exist if you want to go with an open source license option here's your path if you want to go with a commercially supported option that you know it follows the original path you know there's another path there so i i I'm not sure how this will play out. Um, you know, certainly we've seen this play out in other ecosystems, but I think each one plays out differently. Another aspect of this situation is that 
the promise of the open source license that users started using this under is something that's known to them. And I think one of the risks is if we let organizations start to change the meaning of open source. And the companies who have made this switch have built their companies calling them open source companies, open source products, open source this and that in their marketing. It's in their materials. They're at open source conferences saying the same. Now they're not suddenly open source anymore. And how do we deal with that and make sure that we retain the core definition of what is open source and not let that get uh, muddled? And I think OSI has been doing a great job holding the line on that. And I, I don't expect any difference from there, from them on that position. But um, there are reasons why decades ago people said this is what open and free software is. And these are the definitions that we're going to follow. And it's not something that should change every year based on some company's revenue cycle. Since we are talking about open source and sometimes you know, the term open source or open doesn't actually mean open that and that I'm heading to uh, AI, generative AI, you know, uh, and you folks, you know, I was talking, Gab, you are making some announcement here as well in terms of, you know, the, so talk a bit about what work we can expect from Linux Foundation in the context of AI. Uh, generative AI and open source. The Linux Foundation, we are not the ones who create projects. We're not the innovators out there. There's developers, there's data scientists who are truly pushing the envelope on what we can do from an innovation perspective. And from the Linux Foundation, what we expect is that we've already been in discussion with a number of them. They are building communities around these AI, generative AI models, whether they be large language models or even specialized models or foundational models. And uh, I think the moment that they want to collaborate at scale is when they generally come talk to us. And there their issue is we need to put some governance around how we're making decisions around this. And it's getting to be too big. We need to figure out how to structure things appropriately. And that's generally where we get involved. We're also a neutral home where maybe one company started a model, but maybe they perceive that they're limited in the growth and adoption of that model because it's owned by one company. And so I think the same drivers of what drives open source projects to come to a foundation will be value propositions for generative AI communities. Um, it may not be that we need to be the home to own all of the data or all of you know some aspect of it, but there is a collaborative element going on. You know, There's a project that we're talking to right now. They have 1,500 people on their Discord channel. This is a big collaboration for them and they need to figure out how do we support and sustain that. And by the way, that's just in a year. <laughs> What's it going to look like next year, or the year after in terms of the scale of these communities and the ability to support everything that needs to get done? I'd say the third aspect of why they're talking to us is we have a lot of developers and data scientists who are hungry for access to GPU resources. GPU resources are going to take companies or financial funding that you know are sustainable, and they're looking at how can we potentially provide access to GPU resources as another option. We are here once again in you know Europe. It's been last year Linux Foundation Europe was announced in Dublin. Uh, so talk a bit about you know in this one year how much progress you folks have made. Of course, I talked to Gab as well, but I want to hear from your perspective also because there are a lot of local problems. CRA is one example that you folks can solve. At the same time, a lot of grassroots open source development happens in Europe. So talk about you know the, the whole. Yeah. I think Linux Foundation Europe has been a, a tremendous proof point that open collaboration is truly permeating society. Uh, what what Linux Foundation Europe. Uh, member companies are working on are issues that are specific to Europe and that are challenges that Europe is trying to work through. And what it has done is it's brought collective peoples who are uh, from different industries in many cases, wallets and payments and, you know, uh, telecommunications, you know, things that may have some open source elements to them already, but um, at a strategic level, we're never you know, designed for that. And now we've got regional specific open source challenges that they want to work on. And so it's a great opportunity to bring people together and, and work on those issues. We did not anticipate the CRA. So Linux Foundation Europe did not, was not set up to do policy work or you know, any sort of elements like that, but it was there in the time to be able to assist. And so it's a good opportunity for a number of those community members who are in Europe to get together, 
talk about what the issues are with the CRA, figure out what is the best path forward, and it provides a forum for them to do that. When I look at you, uh, left Europe, uh, Europe, you know, the public sector is very much active in the open source. So uh, I was talking to Gab also that, you know, yes, getting involved with the public sector is going to be one of the core, you know, work that you folks do here. Yeah. So, so can you also talk about the involvement, engagement? I'm not talking about CRA, but in general, because there are a lot of policies that are adoption of open source. You know, in some cases, they have the whole join up is there, Europa is there. A lot of work is going on in the open source space in Europe. One of the surprising things is that open source in Europe have been kind of synonymous in terms of software. And it has been always a strong a European Commission and the European Union have been strong proponents of open source solutions. It levels the playing field, it gives everybody, you know, the ability to create their own solutions and it enables the small and medium enterprise ecosystem. What is surprising about the CRA is that none of the people who know about open source were consulted in the process. And so a software regulation was developed without input from the people in the European Union who actually know about how open source and software developed and built who could have shaped this into something that would have been more more impactful. We also engage with other countries and their leadership and their governments and we get asked questions, um, but they approach things very differently. So in the United States, they're looking at software security, software supply chain security. They've done executive orders and everything else. In the same way that the European Union is at you know, a strategic level trying to help bring better security to open source and to software, the United States approached it very differently because they brought the experts in open source and software to the table and asked them how can we best affect the change we want and took their feedback and built programs, structures based on input from the experts in the field. In Europe, we have it completely reversed. We're policy, regulatory people who are used to assigning liability in industries every single day went and did it the way they do it in other industries or other contexts. But it just doesn't work for open source software because this is not single company derived. It's collaboratively built. It's not just companies building it. You have academics, developers, individuals, uh, you know, a very large ecosystem involved in the creation of this public good that is available to everyone, but it's available under the open source terms. Since we are talking about the contrast, the way you, the policymakers in the Europe versus, you know, U.S. works. So talk about the recent, you know, work that you folks did with the, the government. What the U.S. government has done is engaged people in the field, in the industry, who are doing the actual work. And their goal is to better learn how they can support a process that leads to a better security outcome. And so years ago, they started talking to people in the field in, in some of our projects about things like software bill of materials. And they got the idea of, oh, SPDX, this is how we have transparency of what software is coming through the supply chain. And that was the lead up of years of learning and education and meetings and showing up in our communities to understand how do software bills of material work? How would we potentially put this into effect for our government's procurement of software? And using the government as a way to help disseminate the practice of doing software bill materials. And so this is a years long investment that they have made. Um, it has survived administrations. Um, it is something that I think, you know, is a way that is effective because the regulations they're coming out with are not any less impactful. It's that they're more targeted to what actually works. Mike, once again, thank you so much for taking time out, sitting down with me and talk about these topics. And I would love to chat with you again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it.